I, I love this one because I, I love how I feel after working out. And it was really fun to get into this. Um, and honestly, what we'll talk about today is just the, barely the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more you can get into on this. So if you're, if you find this interesting at all, I really encourage you to jump in, um, and, and get into it because there is a lot, we could go deep in the weeds on this and talk for hours, but uh, we, we're, we're not going to do that to you today. Um, but the first thing I want to say is there's actually a really good book on this that recently came out. It's called the joy of movement and it's by Kelly McGonigal. She's a Stanford researcher. Researcher. And so she looks into the neurobiology of exactly this. So what is it that is so awesome and, and feel good about getting out and moving your body and exercising? Um, so she, she really digs into the science on this, but in a very, very accessible way. So I, I highly recommend that book. Um, and then she, she does make the point that it's not just about working out either movement in general boosts mood and a sense of well-being so this can be dance it can be going out for a walk you know and even just walking up and down stairs um and we'll get into more about why so first off we if you're listening to this podcast <laughs> we've talked a lot about how exercise has tons of benefits as we know and these are both acute and long term so you can get actually even just like a really big cognitive boost right after a workout. And then there are also long-term cognitive benefits. Um, we also have physiological benefits that we know about, but, uh, to, to Nuno's question, I really want to get into the feelings today. Like I'll, let's, let's talk about feelings. <laughs> um, I'm in, let's hit the feels, let's hit the feels. Going to hit the feels. So, um, there've been, uh, there's at least one meta-analysis that came out in 2013, that looked at high quality randomized trials. They looked at 39 studies with a total of 2,326 participants. Um, and they found that exercise does actually improve, uh, or alleviate symptoms of depression. So we do know that there are some really great mood boosting qualities of working out. And, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of why. So probably as we say this, you know, and somebody talks about feeling good after doing a workout, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, it's that endorphin rush, right? Like, yeah, we just get those endorphins, get that endorphin high. Um, and that's true that we do see like a big increase in endorphins. Uh, but the story's not as straightforward as it might seem. So endorphins are produced in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So these are part of your endocrine system. So we think of the endocrine system. These are glands in the body that produce hormones that influence all of the other sy systems in the body as well as the brain. And I'm going to come back to why that's really interesting in a minute, but, uh, the endorphins are no different. So the endorphins, they're part of the endocrine system and they are, uh, produced and secreted by the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands and endorphins are structurally similar to morphine. So they activate the opioid receptors in the body. Um, so that means that they have an analgesic effect. That's they decrease, they decrease discomfort and pain. I don't know if you've ever heard the term motion is lotion, but getting out <laughs> exercising, it is going to make you feel better because of these endorphins. Um, and then they also increase a sense of well well-being and euphoria. So that seems like a pretty straightforward explanation, right? Like you do a workout, you get your endorphins, you're going to feel good. Um, and there is a lot of evidence that shows there's a dramatic increase in blood plasma, the, the levels of endorphins in blood plasma following exercise. But what's really cool and interesting is they've recently discovered that these endorphins are actually too large to pass the blood brain barrier, which means that just because they increase in your blood plasma doesn't mean that they're actually getting to your brain which is wild, right? Because when you think of that endorphin rush and that endorphin high, you kind of think like, oh yeah, my, my brain is flooded with endorphins, but that's actually not necessarily what's happening. So it doesn't mean that the endorphins aren't affecting the brain. Cause I mean, if your whole body has a sense of alleviated pain and a sense of well being and euphoria, it doesn't mean that that's not going to affect your brain in some other way. Um, and this is where a phenomenon called crosstalk comes in. So when we talk about the human body, we talk about different systems, endocrine system, cardiovascular system, musculoskeletal system. Um, and we think of them, we label them as discrete systems, but we know that these systems are all connected. They're interdependent, they're interrelated, and they're constantly communicating with each other. Uh, so the endorphins are, you know, they may be one part of this crosstalks, but what's interesting is they're not directly just flooding your brain and giving you that endorphin rush, which is really interesting. One of the molecules that is, is called anandamide and anandamide is, uh, one of a family of compounds called cannabinoids. And we have, uh, our body makes cannabinoids 
endogenously, which is they arise, they're naturally produced in the body. And yes, yes, <laughs> it's the same system that's affected by the THC in cannabis. So um, we do have high levels of anandamides, um, an anandamide and these endocannabinoids in our system after exercise. And these things actually can cross the blood brain barrier. So yes, they are getting into the brain's endocannabinoid system and they are affecting that system in very much the same way as THC. So they're going to have an anti-anxiety effect and also some of those analgesic effects. Um, also in the brain, we're looking at uh, uptake or sorry, like an upregulation of neurotransmitters. So we see an increase in serotonin and nor norepinephrine in general, uh, in particular, and both of these neurotransmitters are correlated. A deficit of these neurotransmitters are correlated with different mental health issues, including depression. So having more of these, we would assume would alleviate those depressive sy symptoms. Um, or at least that's what the, the research suggests. So we have multiple compounds at work in the body that we know are increasing after exercise. Um, but this is the one that I'm really excited to talk about. <laughs> this one, you could go really deep in the weeds on this one. And this is the one um, that I first learned about through Kelly McGonigal's writing. And these compounds are called myokines. Now, there's a lot of different types of these, so you can, you can read all about them. Uh, these are secreted by contracting muscles. So this is what's super cool going back to, you know, the endocrine system and things like our adrenal glands that are producing hormones like testosterone and estrogen. We know that those manufacture and produce compounds that affect all of the other systems in the brain and the body, but your muscles do the same thing. Your muscles are actually manufacturing and secreting compounds that affect other systems in the body, including the brain and that, um, that are, that are initiating this kind of crosstalk. And these myokines are actually secreted by contracting muscles in particular. So how cool is that? You're actually moving and contracting your muscles and you turn them into these little endocrine organs that start secreting these compounds. Now, myokines in particular have amazingly beneficial effects. So they are most and, and affecting a lot of these different systems, right? So a lot of the benefits that we see are to the immune system, the metabolic systems. Uh, we see cognitive, cognitive benefits as well as mood benefits. So these things, depending on which one you're looking at, and some of them do multiple things, um, they can reduce inflammation. They can increase blood glucose control. They can serve as fast acting antidepressants, and some can even help people recover from trauma. I mean, how cool is this? Your muscles are amazing. doing this. <laughs> I kind of like listening to all of this. I feel like I'm doping just by exercise. But it I happens know. To everybody. You are. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. You're a drug so, addict. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get into that once Amber's through. So I'm going to come out as an addict, actually. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, it creates this virtuous cycle, right? Like there's, all you know, the more you move, the more it feels good. The more you want to move, the more you're going to feel good. It's It's a great thing. And a really good example of this, I'm just going to dig a little bit into the weeds on one of these myokines. It's PGC uh, one alpha one, and I'm just going to call it BG PGC for now. But if you want to look up the study, it's um, Agudelo et al. in 2004. This was published in Cell, and they did so. This was a study on mice. So take it with a grain of salt. Um, we haven't really explicitly seen this in humans, but mechanistically. Um, this seems there are analogous systems. So this is, this is really interesting and has some implication for human physiology as well. So they did a study on transgenic mice, which is that they changed the genetics of these mice so that they expressed, uh, this PGC one alpha one consistently and the muscle. And this is, this is a compound that is specific to the skeletal muscle. So the skeletal muscles, this is one of the myokines that the skeletal muscles produce. Um, these mice that were genetically mutated to express this gene and, and create more of this were actually more resistant to depression and more resistant specifically to stress induced depression. So this compound that you're contracting muscles secrete actually has a protective mechanism mechanistically protects the brain protects you from stress induced depression which is super super interesting and the mechanism that they identified was it um this pgc i'm just going to call it pgc but the pgc affects a pathway called kynurenine and kynurenine has its own little pathway but what the pgc does in a 
quick summary of terms is it reduces the kynurenine that's available to cross the blood brain barrier. And by doing that, it actually protects the brain from these stress induced changes that are associated with depression. It's so cool. And then if you go to a, this, a study by one of the same authors in 2019, they look at how PGC actually affects exercise. So PGC also increases your ability to use fuel. So it increases your, uh, your efficiency in, um, using glycogen, but it also increases your fat oxidation efficiency. What? Right. <laughs> so <laughs> you, <laughs> you go, right? Like this is amazing, right? You go and you exercise, you're contracting your muscles, your muscles start making and secreting <clears throat> PGC, which makes you better able to contract your muscles and exercise. So now you can exercise even better and more efficiently than before and make more PGC, which is going to make you more able to exercise better and more efficiently. And the whole time, the more of the stuff that you make, the more it's protecting you against stress induced depression. It's crazy cool. It's amazing. Right? Right? <laughs> Yeah, like it's like thinking about like all the yeah, all the different things that go on in this world that basically, you know, like pretty large problems and and how much exercise could help with it for sure. Oh my gosh. I, I, and this is just one. This is one of the myokines. It's crazy. Like one of the things that I think of too, like so I mean this basically like we just we just deep dove on what runner's high is, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, people like talk about what runner's high is. But I find that like if I do a long race, like after Leadville, uh, I didn't feel much runner's high. Um, after yeah, a lot of low actually. <laughs> um, but if I go into like a criterium, oh my gosh, like after a crit, like, yeah, I'm, I'm runner's high for a while. Right. Like, and I feel that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love short, hard races is because I'm an addict to it. Like I just, I love that feeling. And I think that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that the intensity, the the higher perceived risk that you have, which is, you know, in a criterium, d definitely real. Um, <laughs> but the higher risk that you're going against everything else, I'm sure that augments these sort of effects to some degree in some way. But um, man, it's it's like a it's a benefit that I look forward to even after like a hard workout when I'm not racing with other people or anything else, but like a high, it doesn't even have to, when I say high intensity, I mean, even sweet spot stuff. It's like <laughs> challenging and difficult, but I go through that whole process. It just feels awesome. And I think it's pretty cool that we have that gift, so to speak, to, yeah. to kind of like experience for all that hard work. Well, like Amber said, it, it's a virtuous cycle. I mean, how many times yeah. you coax yourself onto the bike or onto the treadmill or into the pool knowing that you will feel better afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I feel like that's a super important thing for us to have. Like, I'm really glad we're designed this way because yeah. otherwise it'd be pretty hard for us to just go back into it again without <laughs> having that benefit, you know? Well, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Like obviously exercise movement has so much physiological benefit toward survival that it would make sense that we would have evolved systems that would encourage us in those directions mm -hmm. as well. I mean, it, it, it is logical, but also, I mean, I think this is a really interesting point too, that you made Chad, which is that, you know, sometimes mood follows action. Like I know sometimes I can get, you know, I'm having kind of a rough day and I'm thinking like, man, I'm just not motivated to ride. And it's like, yeah, but sometimes the motivation doesn't have to come first. Sometimes it's just about do the thing. And then the motivation will come either during the workout, or maybe it won't even be until after you're done that you're like, man, yeah, I'm really glad I did that. I feel great. And then you're motivated for the next day. But mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember that it's not always the emotion that comes first. Sometimes you have to act first and then the emotion will come afterward. Get through the first, get through the warm up in the first interval. Mm -hmm. And then that next like little recovery after that, then make the decision before that next interval. If you still feel horrible, right? maybe it's not time, but a lot of times that's enough. Your mood gets up. You're like, I can do this. This isn't so bad. And almost always the second interval is easier than the first interval. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. This is, this is good reason once again to look <laughs> into the why behind things rather than just chalking it up to what you feel. Because now, like, if you, you you know listening to that, you now know that there are mechanisms and systems in place to make this happen, so you can right. count on that, right? Rather than just hoping that it's going to happen and you felt it before, so you figure it'll happen. There is a big difference there, so it's it can be a big motivator. Um, is there anything else you want to cover on this one before we get into caffeine? Well, I think I, mean, I just want to follow up on thing. what Nate said, which was a really good point. So 
this whole, you know, mood follows action. It doesn't mean that you need to force yourself onto the bike every single day. There are going to be days that you need to take a day off and going way back to the beginning of this episode, (laughs) um, we talked about the need to balance total life stress with recovery. And so there are going to be times when really you do just need to take the day off and that's okay. And if you get to that point and you know, like Nate said, if you get on the bike, you give it the first interval and you still feel terrible, you need to take the day off and do that. Make the decision, make it a clean, clean decision. It's done. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't, you know, drag yourself over the coals for it. Really just say, okay, you know what? Today is a day I need to just give myself a little bit more recovery, a little bit more rest, come back fresher the next time. Um, but yeah, just know that your body is equipped with these systems that are meant to encourage movement. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. Your body. Yeah. Your body is amazing. <laughs> this, um, I think we should probably have a, this is another product would have Chad's voice in there. Um, <laughs> we give you. Chad, uh, Chad just looks like he's saying goody. <laughs> Can't wait. Uh, we're, I, I think everyone's going to agree on this. Uh, we give you permission on those days that Amber said that the thought you should have is stopping will make me faster. Yeah. Like that's, that's the thought. Like this is what I'm supposed to, this is my training today is doing is not training. And it's that resting. is what's going to bring me better in the future. And I think a lot of people can't get around that in their head and it's they hard. need someone else to say it. Um, and just Chad has the gravitas. Chad, can you just say what I just said? If you believe it. <laughs> and then we're going to cut it out. No, I can't. No. <laughs> say, it, say it again. No, no, it's a, it's a very good point. I mean, sometimes- Resting will make me faster. Yeah, sometimes Stopping resting will, make, will faster. make you faster indeed. That's it. I mean, yeah. we, we, like I said, you encourage yourself onto the bike or into the, into the workout with the, not the promise of feeling better afterwards, but the likelihood of it. So at some point along the course of that, not so great workout, you do have to recognize this is a day where resting is going to make me faster. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It happens. Uh, Yep. And doubling down on that in a different or in a similar vein, you should put equal effort into your rest as you would your training. Cause it's very easy on those days to just like cut it off and think you're done training and then carry on with everything else in life. But if you cut it out and you had 45 minutes left, spend that 45 minutes doing everything that you can to recover, right? Yeah. Like it makes a difference. Yeah. We also, we talked about VO2 max work and going deep and I want to describe the difference. There are days where the workout is just really hard. Like I'm feeling fine, but wow, this is a big workout. HTFU, like get, get into that one. Right. Then there are days where you're like, wow, this, this initial like 50% is really hard. The next thing, like things that shouldn't be hard are extremely hard. Like you just, and feel they don't de- change after the yeah, first bit. Exactly. Yeah. You feel depleted. Your motivation is super low and it doesn't change. and doesn't improve. That would be a signal. And two, during the rest of the day, you might be tired and might be a little bit moody, extra hungry, not thinking as clearly like all of these things, you might be super sore, um, not sleeping well at night, like getting up in the middle of the night, having night sweats from all of those are like signs that, wow, I should probably be listening to my body yeah. on the flip side. Make sure you HTFU on like, we're, you try really hard <laughs> fuel. on some workouts. Fuel. Yes. Yeah. Fuel. Yeah. yeah. Yep. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.